All right, we are live. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is a special comics launch interview. I'm excited to be with you all because we are going to be talking about how to get your books selling on Kickstarter with uh, the guy who literally wrote the book on it. Uh, so my guest today is no stranger to the Comics Launch podcast. He's a USA Today best-selling author, publisher, and speaker. He runs the imprint Wannabe Press, which publishes weird books for weird people. And to date, he's raised over $250,000 on the Kickstarter platform across 18 projects that have included prose novels, graphic novels, anthologies, and more. And his latest nonfiction project is Get Your Book Selling on Kickstarter, which is co-written with Monica Lionel. So welcome back to the show, Russell Nolte. How you doing, Russ? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's kind of weird to have a book on Kickstarter, selling on Kickstarter to help people sell books on Kickstarter. It's uh, meta, meta, of, meta. <laughs> a friend of mine was like, this is the most Russell Nolte thing I've ever seen you do. And I was like, <laughs> I have to admit, like when I come up, when we come up with the idea, I laughed. And I was like, this is too good to not do. Right. And, 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 but also it's like, how can you not do it? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, the, 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 if you're not willing to launch it on Kickstarter, it sort of like defeats the, 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 the promise of the premise. Right. So, yeah, it's really weird to, cause it's a nonfiction book. So like, yeah. you know, I've made, I've made my bona fides basically like launching books on Kickstarter, but it was really, it was, a, it was that same feeling, sinking feeling that like I get when I've ever launched a new, whether it was a, whether it was a novel series or a comic or we did, I did a kid's book once or, or, uh, or just a brand new series. But like, this was like a whole new thing for me. So I had to almost go back and relearn all of the things that, mm. that you learn from like, it's like, I've been doing these, you know, I have my own courses and I've, I had my own uh, course site for a while called the complete creative. So like I've taken courses by like, you know, the Frank Kearns and the Russell Brunson's and like go down the list, Amy Porterfield, you know, all of those people. So it was going back a lot and being like, okay, like what works in the nonfiction space? What like works on Kickstarter? And like, how can we merge these two things together? But really it's been wonderful to work with Monica because Monica has spent her career, a huge part of her career in nonfiction. So like she like knows the nonfiction space and me between her knowing the nonfiction space and me knowing the Kickstarter space, it's been like a really great partnership. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's great to have you back. I mean, every time I have you on the show, I have to go and update your resume because you've written a, a bunch of new books and uh, raised a ton more money on Kickstarter. And the latest book uh, that we mentioned is live right now. Uh, get your book selling on Kickstarter and uh, doing great. And this looks like a, you're, you're uh, running it for a little bit of a longer time. Because uh, and and just speak to me about that. I mean, you're, you're usually someone that. Uh, it seems like you've been going for shorter campaigns for certain projects, but this one you're going to give a little bit more time. And I'm just uh, I'm curious as a as a time, uh, someone that's paid attention to, the, to, to time and length of launches. Um, what was your thinking going into this with you and, and Monica? Well, we actually started it. So first of all, like this is Monica's campaign, like mm -hmm. I'm supporting it. Uh, so like she's going to be the one that's stuck running it for 36 more days uh, by herself <laughs> while I'm at one week on vacation in in, in Cabo. Um, but uh, so we sort of designed the campaign to start next week. But uh, we I this is going to be really like like a very niche problem. But like I bought StreamYard. For a, for a month uh, to do my WannaCon. And mm -hmm. it just so happened that like the subscription ends on the 9th, which is tomorrow. And so it's like, I could do a whole, like I do this conference called the Online Writers Conference and I could do like a mini one for four hours for, for, for like tomorrow before, the, before it ends. So mm -hmm. I asked her if she wanted to make it a week longer and we discussed it. And the thing with nonfiction, one of the big differences is content marketing is such a bigger part of the nonfiction space. I mean, like we talk about being on podcasts when we launch comics, right? But it's a whole right. different world when it comes to nonfiction stuff because podcasts, especially like podcasts like this are kind of set up for teaching things. And yeah. so just the whole space is made for like medium is really made for nonfiction work. Uh, 
Uh, most like blog and content marketing that I do is nonfiction work. You know, almost everything is built around content marketing. And the thing with content marketing is it just, it takes longer to work. And so having a longer campaign allows us to have a lot of the content marketing, the podcast like this one and, and all of the stuff kind of accumulate throughout the campaign and give us a longer window. But just like I talk about in the comic space, or I know you talk about it too, I, well, we talked about it before, is you should always try and and uh, and make a convention, like at least do one live appearance during a, a, a Kickstarter. It's not been a thing we could do for a year and a half, but yeah. now... Uh, so there's a there's a conference called Twenty Books, which is a self publishing conference. We wanted to end the the the, the show there, uh, the 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 campaign at at the show or a couple of days after the show. And so we wanted to um, we decided to make that the end. And then when the the sort of beginning kept getting stretched out and stretched out, it just got a little bit longer and a little bit longer. But I think it's going to work out in our favor because unlike in the comic space where Kickstarter is this ubiquitous term, um, it's kind of uh, a pariah in the publishing space, in the book space. Um, not only either people haven't heard about it or they've heard about it negative, negatively much more than they've heard about it positively. And the success rate of a publishing campaign is still around 35%. It's one of the lower, it's on the lower half of the public of the, of all of all uh, categories, yeah. uh, which is kind of weird because they like should go hand in hand with comics. I mean, they're, they're both books. They're both bound. Like they're both like one has words and one is pictures with, with words. Like one is often color and one is usually black and white. Like one has imagery and one usually doesn't, but like they're like, they, they're, they're part of the same, like they're from the same mother. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, this month we, I've sort of uh, been, you know, leading a charge and a, and a victory lap for comic creators on Kickstarter because, you know, we've achieved this, this ranking now where comics, the comics that let launch on Kickstarter comic creators are the most likely to succeed versus any other platform. Um, but the, that publishing rate has been stuck in the 30 to 35% range since I've been sort of watching that in terms of 35% successful, um, which means, you know, the 65% aren't. Um, and so I'm great. I think it's awesome that, that your book is coming into that space to try to address that. And I do believe that there are, is a lot that comic creators can teach the pros, uh, and the, and, and the novel world, uh, about how to be successful on Kickstarter. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that and just to, um, you know, it seems like there may be a more like, as you said, there's a, a the self-publishing stigma has largely left the comic book space, but still does seem to persist in prose, fiction and nonfiction worlds. I'm curious, um, you know, why you think that might be and, you know, and, and, and is that really the case as far as you from what you've seen? I mean, I know exactly why that is, or at least I think I know exactly why. In comics, the biggest names self-publish. Uh, Scott Snyder, like literally is making news uh, every every week for self-publishing. James Tyrion, like just signed a self-publishing contract. Uh, 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 I mean, down the list. I mean, I can't name all of the people that have self-published books. I mean, uh, 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 um Stan Lee self-published books through his own company. So like, I mean, the biggest names in, in, in publishing have for decades self-published. The seven biggest artists at Marvel literally left Marvel to form their own self-publishing company. So like for since at least the 90s and before that, I mean, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, one of the biggest comics of all time. Uh, came from self-publishing. Men in Black was a self-published comic. You know, there's uh, going back to zines, zines in the 60s and 70s, and all of these things like the or the 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 the, the bones of self-publishing have been in uh, in comics forever. And also, com like comics has always been kind of the ugly stepchild of publishing. It's always been this thing, which is it's really weird to watch. Like comics have this huge resurgence and a huge huge surgence in like the YA publishing, uh, in the YA like space and suddenly having publishing experts talk about how comics are the new thing. And I'm like, 
like literally predates most of the com companies that that exist publishing books. Um, you know, so it's 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 this odd thing that publishing is trying to take ownership of comics when like really the onus of it has come from self-publishing since the genesis. I mean, a lot of the best comic creators of forever have come from the self-publishing side and have been like anointed by Marvel and DC after their like books are successful. So I think of someone like Robert Kirkman who like did all of these books for Marvel uh, largely after uh, ba Battle Pope and, and then uh, Walking Dead became this huge phenomenon as opposed to comp to novels where almost everything is revolves around self of uh, uh, traditional publishing, getting a traditional publishing contract. There's basically one conference uh, called 20 books, uh, which is, uh, which is self publishing specific, but almost everything else in the industry from publishing experts on down are about getting a traditional publishing contract at a time where it's less and less lucrative to do so and less and less advised to do so for most authors. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it, I think it's nice to see that um, at, at least there are uh, creators like yourself. And, and honestly, you know, we've had a number of creators that are, are inside the comics community that have also do prose work and have gone and tested the waters. And wouldn't you know, they've been able to uh, succeed for their prose work as well. Now, you've published comics and prose. Uh, you've built a large audience for both. But I know that there are some out there that might be thinking about that and, and you know, and they might be concerned that there's two different audiences there. But um, have you found that your comics audiences follow you to your books or vice versa? Or, or how how is that sort of how have you sort of tracked that? And, and what have you found? I mean, it's definitely not a one to one comparison. Probably about half of the people that read my comics read my prose and often during a prose campaign they will say do more comics but the truth is like i can't do the god's verse chronicles as a comic like i just a i've written 11 novels over a million words like that would take a decade to do as a comic more than a decade to do uh, as a comic so uh, what i have learned uh, works really well is to have a series uh, maybe a very expensive series, but like a popular series that you can do both in. So we've now released three graphic novels in the Gods vs. Chronicles. And uh, come the next uh, the next time we do a Gods vs. Chronicles novel campaign, we'll have 11 novels. And so there's there's plenty of cool stuff for comics book people. But if they move, if, 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 if they want to have a deeper conversation about the world, they're going to have to read the books because I just literally, I can make... 11 novels or 10 or 11 novels for the same price as one graphic novel. And that is not an over-exaggeration. It costs me about a thousand dollars, a thousand to $1,500 to do a, uh, to do a God's verse Chronicles novel. Mm -hmm. And that's like all in minus printing. It cost me roughly $15,000 to do Katrina hates the dead. And like, that's five issues. So yeah, the, there's more money, when if you do single issues uh, and, and you can do one, two, three, four, five, and then a trade, but like it's, it, I can, I can over the course of a year, write five, 10 novels and it costs the same as making one graphic novel. Now that's not always the case that the production of black market harem was considerably less than, 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 uh, than um, Katrina hates the dead. But even then I just ran the numbers. Like I did a $12,000 campaign. I ended up with $2,000 of profit roughly once it's all said and done, assuming there's no additional cost, which like still cost me over $10,000 to make that book, even yeah. though it was like the least expensive book that I've ever made. Whereas I, I, I can do almost 10 books for that same novels for that same price. But on top of that, as a writer, I, I always, I always cringe a little bit when someone says they're a comics book writer or a prose writer or a movie writer or a TV writer or a mm. video game writer. Like if you're a writer, you should be writing in media in different mediums. Like, you know, I know a lot of successful authors and, and writers who over the course of their career, like they write in many different genres and to say, I'm a comic book writer, like limits your ability to like be a writer because the money you know, I'm friends with Marv Wolfman, and he talks about this often in our writers group. He says, you know, like the money in an industry will dry up 
you know, you'll stop getting writing work. And man, it's really nice to be able to get animation work or to be able to get prose work or to be able to be get to be get a video game work. And like he works on all of these things at the same time or like, you know, he was in a wave of doing uh, he did uh, the, the, the the Raven books and then he moved to doing um, he moved to doing uh, um, uh, video games now. So like it's just it's a way to be fluid with your career and take control of it, because frankly, as a comic book writer, you have very little control, even if you make independent comics like you are at the whim. The minute you sign that contract with an artist, you are at their whim. Mm -hmm. You are at the whim of their speed at whether they have a, 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 a hand injury, whether they get hired by Marvel and whether they like have to take on a third project and when, uh, whether they like get into the hospital or someone they love is a problem, you know, whether they have a health scare. I mean, I've seen all of this stuff and we haven't even talked about like artists just walking away from projects because like, uh, I don't think that's the biggest problem if you, if you hire, right. But like I have worked on books that the artist got carpal tunnel and for literally six months just couldn't draw. And like, thank goodness I had that, I had a, a buffer to where I could put slot in another project. But you know, when you're, when you're taking, when you're doing pros, like you are in control, like no other medium when it comes to a yeah. writer, like you have control of the, of, of the output of the whole product. And I'm not saying don't do comics. I'm not saying like, don't do video games. I'm saying like you as a writer or the, or the steward of an IP, need to think about expanding the IP to the most uh, most people to see it. And I mean, let's be frank here about independent comics, like the aftermarket after Kickstarter for independent comics, if you don't do shows is dismal at best. Like even if you get a, a diamond deal, like they're gonna order 300, 500, maybe a thousand copies of your book, like you're gonna make a thousand dollars. And like, that is going to be for most people, like the max that they do if they're not doing shows. So whereas books, novels have a massive aftermarket, like a billion dollar industry of just aftermarket after a Kickstarter books, because that's how that's how novels are set up. Like there are all sorts of ways to get your book to, to get a novel selling that just currently don't work for ninety nine point nine percent of 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 comics and i love comics this is not me denigrating comics but like as a comic creator the aftermarket is just sick for novels comparatively to comics hmm. yeah so uh, yeah i want to i want to talk and, and get into that aftermarket uh for novels in a in a moment but before i do that i, I don't want to gloss over it especially for those out there that might be trying to hey they, i'm working on my first novel um and maybe I'm thinking about going the self-publishing route because I don't uh, I, I, I'm worried about, you know, or I might not be able to find a publisher or publishers are only interested in working with established authors. So how do you get established? Uh, but uh, but you said, you know, you budget around $1,000 to uh, is, is what it's going to cost you to get a, uh, a novel made. Can you talk about just break down how that how that cost breaks down for you? Uh, because I, I know there are some writers out there who's like, hey, hey, wait, uh, you know, I'm, I'm writing this thing and it doesn't cost me anything to write. Uh, sure. What, so what are costs, those costs that, that so, you come up with? Uh, it costs money to get the cover made. You know, I mean, you could spend thousands of dollars on a cover, but like if you spend two hundred dollars to get like both an ebook and then a wraparound cover, um, which is you need. So uh as opposed to comics where like a lot of comics will just do their own wraparounds or like i do my own wraparounds for the comic i just get the one image or maybe i'll get two images They're usually with with novels you'll get a, a cover like a front image for like ebook and print and then you'll get a wraparound that like includes the spine and the back and so usually that's somewhere between 50 and 100 dollars to get the wrap to upgrade to the wrap and then a cover is somewhere between you know a hundred to two hundred dollars usually. You know, I try and stay around a hundred dollars. But you know, if you are trying to stay completely to market and you want to like set fire to uh, to like your book and like make it and it hit all the tropes and make like a tropius thing, like you could spend a thousand dollars just on the cover alone. Mm -hmm. um, after the cover, you need an editor. Uh, an editor. I mean, again, this is this is I've had editors that cost me a hundred dollars and an editor that cost me eight hundred dollars. Um, it usually costs me, uh, usually costs me for a ninety thousand word book. You know, it'll and that's that's the other thing. Like it depends on how big long the book is. So 
my God's Verse Chronicles books cost me more like twelve hundred to thirteen hundred dollars usually for a, for a, for a cover because for 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 a whole book because the cover is not different, but the just I'm it's a third longer than my sixty thousand word books, which are where my where my like sweet spot is about sixty thousand words usually. Um, so uh, it costs, and then you have to get a proofreader. Proofreaders uh, cost you know somewhere between again, a hundred and $400, depending on the length of the book. Uh, you might need a second proofreader. Uh, honestly, like I probably would recommend getting a second, like two proofreader eyes on it. If, uh, uh, just, just because like the first one can catch something, most big publishing houses use two proofreaders. Mm. Um, so uh, you might have a formatter, uh, formatters cost somewhere between 50 and a hundred dollars. I, I generally format my own books, uh, because I want control over them. There's plenty of programs to do that can, uh, from draft to digital to Atticus to vellum that can help you get the formatting, right. Um, but usually it's uh, cover editor, proofreader one, maybe proofreader two, um, and then maybe formatting and all of that comes around to, and then you'll need some proofs. Like you want to get, you'll, you'll want to upload them to, to, to Ingram or, or Kindle or wherever you're going to do it and like get a proof of the book so you can make sure everything is right. And that usually costs somewhere between another 50 and a hundred dollars. So but like just getting the book there, I think usually somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars is a good barometer of where you can have like a really great killer book, pay like industry rates and, uh, and, 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 and reasonably expect to get some, get a good product at the end between the, the, those price points, you can get it much lower and you might luck out. Uh, but if you just budget that, I think that, uh, I mean, I've had, I, I have a lot of friends who pay 300 to $500 for books, but I've never found, and, and but I also have a lot of friends who pay 2000 to $5,000 for books. And it really kind of just depends on, on, uh, on who your editor is, who your cover artist is who, uh, what, how, how, and, and then just like with comics, the difference of a cover artist, whether they do a photo realistic, like they, or they're designing a custom illustration or, or if they're using stock photos or if they're using an exclusive stock photo, all of those things are different depending on, um, depending on what you specifically want, uh, and, 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 and need. But I mean, I think a thousand dollars, $1,500 for a, for a longer book is a, is a really good sort of barometer of how much it would cost to make a book. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. And I know, you know, there are probably comic book creators out there that, you know, might just be like, ah, comics, it, it, the grass is always greener. Right. <laughs> and so, but, but, but it's important to know that even if you are the writer, there are still other, other um, expenses that go into putting out a, a compelling product. Um, so let's let's jump back into where you, where you were leading me before I had to had to stop there uh, in the aftermarket for novels versus books. So you're gonna, uh, I mean, it seems to me the way that you're approaching books now is that you are using Kickstarter as the initial launch, momentum building uh, for that, uh, recouping your costs. Um, but what does the journey look like for the book? after the Kickstarter is over and, and what are some of those aftermarket opportunities that you can have once you have a paid for book? Yeah. So, I mean, I, the, the thing you said about paid for is really important because just like comics, when I, when I caution people about what they can expect, like, I think you should expect to recoup your expenses. And like, that's the best, if you do better than that, awesome. But like the most I'm asked, I, I, I expect from a Kickstarter is like, I leave broken even and maybe cross fingers, I can make a couple thousand dollars of profit. But that's been the case for, uh, you know, the most profit I've ever made on a campaign is something like $8,000 in all the books that I've done. Uh, I mean, I get stock afterwards, which is great. Uh, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not like raking it in even when I do a $40,000 campaign. I know you talked about this with your uh, big launch, which was, um, um, uh, you know, you, you used it all to get product like that, that huge campaign, like you used, I mean, probably not all of it, but like a large portion of that money to get products. So you can be prepared for the, for the rush of the holidays. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's, that's the, the dilemma that you're, you're faced with when launching, because sure. Like if, if I wanted to, and if you wanted to maximize profit, like, or maximize short-term profit, like, 
those choices are different than what you would do if you're trying to maximize profit overall. And so, you know, when, and I think it this is something that you can get better with as you get into this publishing world and as you've been in here, here longer because um, inventory has a cost to it and, and it also has a risk to it. But the more you can prove that your stuff will sell and can sell, the more confidence that you have that there is an aftermarket for it, then it makes sense to increase those order numbers, lower that per unit cost, increase those margins uh, over the course of this launch. And, and, and that's how you turn, you know, a potentially, you know, uh, a, a uh, like, like if the Kickstarter succeeds, um, that's just the that's just a small piece of the overall success. I know not every campaign is going to be that way, but the key to whether or not it is is do you have the opportunity to sell that book after the campaign is over? And yeah, so exactly. um, I, I noticed that this is a series that Monica has um, has done uh, the get your book selling series, and it seems like there's a good way to sort of look at the 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 waterfront that's available for for authors um, is just through the the, the series of books that she's that, that she offers. Um, yeah, this is I mean, it's a great series. I've I helped on the Kickstarter book and I think five other books. Um, I think there's an extra book that's not in there right now. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, there's there, the only thing that I, I I wish was in there right now that I only realized was something about subscriptions like Patreon mm -hmm. or something, uh, which is not in there. But aside from that, like I think she covers everything uh, to do with uh, with selling books and you know, comics or books. I want to make sure people are like the book selling series, the, but this, this series about Kickstarter also works for kicks for, for comics because comics mm -hmm. are books. It is focused on novelists, but like comics are books, picture books are books, like anything that anything that is bound and there, and there's a story between them or even just pages between them is going to benefit from this series. Um, but you're looking at one of the most important things to sell a a a, a series a, a book aftermarket, which is a series. This is one of the issues that I think comes with comics and uh, overall is it's very hard to make enough material to make a series and be able to make it profitable. Like it just if you're talking about needing five or ten books, I'm not talking about issues. I mean books to really make a series profitable. You're looking at five, 10 years of work on a series and hoping that there's it's profitable before you can really run ads to it. Because the real secret of why there's an aftermarket is you can sell, if you have a long series, five, 10 books long, you can run a lot of ads to it and make up money for it. And because the print cost of black and white is so much cheaper than, than color, you don't have to, um, you don't have to even print uh, a, a big stock. You can just do POD when you need it or for shows. So like you're not sending books to warehouses. Uh, you're not where have, don't have warehousing costs and the costs of POD versus, which is sorry, print on demand books versus, uh, versus, um, um, uh, offset runs for, uh, for black and white is not that big a difference, but with color, it's a massive difference. So you're able to print less stock, still make a pretty decent return. And if you can make a series that's five, 10 books long, which you, you can do for literally the same cost as you can make for most single volumes of comics, you have to stand a really good shot of being able to use Facebook ads to recoup your costs. Because as you as I'm sure you know, uh, Tyler, like it costs a lot to make a sale. Like you got to be able to have like a lot of money behind a, a behind a, a sale in order to make it. And like, if you're selling a $3 comic and all you have is $10, that's probably not going to be enough to like make a consistent sale on, on a, on a series. So one of the things that you can really do with novels is, is turn the same amount of money as it takes to make a graphic novel into a series. And if you do it right to get to, you can run, start running ads and doing real promotions on it. Plus the entire ecosystem of books, independent books is made for selling books on Amazon, as opposed to the entire ecosystem of comics that's made for selling books 
I mean, I honestly don't know where, like not even <laughs> Kickstarter, like not, not really Kickstarter. Cause the only people that yeah. are on Kickstarter are the people that are trying to scam you uh, when they're like doing promotional services. There's no like newsletter swaps or things that are set up to really even get your book selling on Kickstarter, starter, except maybe backer kit. Um, and even then it's like with an ads program, uh, and their launch yeah. program. So there's just yeah. I mean, not... I mean, Kickstarter is the thing that's set up to to get you selling on Kickstarter. Yeah, with, but with, with their with, referral network, right? Yeah, but with Amazon, like they're also like they, if they were to do, if they, if it was comparable, like Kickstarter is Amazon. Uh, there are literally thousands of services that are set up to help authors sell their books on Amazon. Right. So there are there are newsletter sites that will that 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 aggregate hundreds, thousands, millions of author of, of readers that you can segment and like sell and like and 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 and, and buy slots into. There are authors who do um who do uh who will do newsletter swaps with you. There are um there are ways to their discount programs. Like there's all of all of the things that like comic book would wish that they had, like books have um because they're such a massive market and there's just like you know comics is 136th of the overall book market the last time i checked and it's probably a little bit better now but not by enough so uh there's and, and also the delivery costs all of the costs that are associated with delivering a book are are lower so and and there are models to to show how to have success selling books after market. If there is a success story of independent people being able to successfully sell their books after market that does not have shows, I have not uh, uh, comics after sh except for shows yeah, and Kickstarter. It's very hard to find it. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, the, the interesting thing is the model for successfully selling your books after the Kickstarter is Kickstarter, because when you're seeing people serialize their books, Unlike anywhere else where second issues do worse than first issues and third issues do worse than second issues, and it's just a downward a downward order slide, um, in terms of total volume of orders for each issue of the series, that actually maintains the same, but you're selling past issues every time you relaunch your Kickstarter right. and often selling selling them uh, a lot when, when you serialize. So... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Kickstarter, Kickstarter, or any place where you can get a fresh launch behind a, a product, um, that that's definitely you know one example of that. And and then I also do like for certain books, right, or, or certain graphic novels, but it, when you get to the point, like like Amazon is that for certain graphic novels, right? Sure. But most of the, most of that space is taken up by the major publishers. It's it's the in, the indie hit that sells consistently every day on Amazon is few and far between. I, like I know it's possible because C is for Cthulhu did that. We hit the algorithm in a way such that you're a book that sells on Amazon, so you become a book that naturally sells on Amazon. And we haven't gone a day in years where we didn't sell us at least one book. Uh, yeah. hard, hardcover physical book. And I know that's, and, and I know there are comics that, and graphic novels that are the same, you know, the walking dead is selling lots of books every day. The, you know, the, some of the bigger all YA graphic novels sell books every single yeah. day. March, um, and I, March and sells I'm, every day. Uh, March sells every day. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, but there's it, no real expectation that like an independent person can really go and do that thing of after after like on Amazon, yeah, like there is oh, with novels. Absolutely not, absolutely not. And, and I hate and I think, saying this because like I love comics and like I'm not trying to trash comics, like <laughs> because like comics are way better on Kickstarter. Like there is no doubt that the kicks that that comics has a community, and because it is the place to buy comics, like they are very 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 invested the, the backers and the people in a way that they are not invested on the publishing side so yeah. like when it comes to kickstarter the thing to remember is that the book the 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 the, the, the comic side is going to it's like a night and day shift like the people like there's been so much literature in the way that there's literature on how to write blurbs and do covers and all of that stuff in independent publishing there's so much literature about how to make a good comic kickstarter 
yeah. that does not exist in publishing. And also the people that do comics on Kickstarter, they care deeply about the platform in a way that I don't think publishing people do on a general. They use it like one time mm. or they use it. They don't become shepherds or like um, uh, ambassadors for Kickstarter. And even if they use it and they've had tons of success, like Brandon Sanderson, like had a, I doubt he comes back more than like once every five years to like do a Kickstarter, even though he made $2 million on Kickstarter. Whereas like someone made $2 million in the comics Kickstarter, like they'd be back every three months to do like a new campaign. <laughs> yeah. Like boom does. Yeah. And so, I mean, this is one thing that I've, I've noticed like comics is a, is an actual Kickstarter community. Right. And, and I, I did this the other day, I clicked around publishing projects, even the projects that Kickstarter was highlighting. And I looked at the creators and, you know, no projects backed, two projects backed, three projects backed. Then I clicked on like the top three or four co comic book projects that they were pushing a hundred projects backed, 300 projects backed, like, and, and, and that makes a difference, you know, when like, I, I think to the fan base, to the audience, when the people that you're following and the authors that you're following and the books you like are actually backing and buying books and, and, Kickstarter's recommendation engine notifies people that are interested in that person. Like that just gives such a tremendous, you know, cre credence and, and um, endorsement to those book, to those projects, what I think really does contribute to that success rate. And so I guess what you're saying, you're saying is there really hasn't been an established to, to, to nearly that uh, extent, the, the community in the publishing space. I don't think anyone's tried, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think anyone, like there's no Tyler, or uh or like any number like there's a number of people in the in in comics community who like like i like like am a i'm a, am a ambassador for comics i've backed over 600 projects on uh and most of them i think like 500 of them are comic projects so like i am a a, a steward of that there are so many people who are stewards of the comic book space in a way that they are not stewards in the publishing category there are people who use it but like i'm not a steward of hammers like i'm not like i use a hammer when i need a hammer but like i don't like talk about hammers all day like yeah, i've been i think haven't, most haven't gone on any hammer podcasts lately right exactly comparatively to like i think most people who use the, the publishing category use it as like a launching point or like a desperate plea to get money when nothing else has worked uh, as opposed to like the first stop in a publishing tour, because with comics and like, really nowhere else except for board games, do, do I see this? I know that there's other categories that like do a pretty good job. But, like board games is the only other real category where people are like, dude, you have to like be a chef, a, a good citizen of this category because like it is so critically important. And I think the reason that board games work so well is like it was dead. Like before mm -hmm. Kickstarter, like board games was a dead industry. Like it was like barely limping along. There was no, there was no way to like make board games that were new and interesting unless you had already made a board game or you're like one of like three companies. Yeah. Like, like when, when, when the same thing with comics, like comics is like, it wasn't limping along in quite the same way, but like it was pretty limping along when it came to independent comics. Like there was like, there was a small amount of comics that could be made and Kickstarter literally showed that like it saved independent comics and open and and, and and it is the reason to me why there is a renaissance of like all of these amazing comics like um and why companies like scout comics can even exist because like they're going to comic the comics category and pulling in really successful comic books and like they're able to like to like become a successful company because of kickstarter and that they're not the only one they're just the one that i happened to mention um and so, uh, uh, so yeah, then no other category really, except for board games, like you can make an independent film outside of the studio system without Kickstarter. It's a nice to have publishing. It's a nice to have like music. It's a nice to have, but like with comics and board games, like it's an essential, like if it went away, an entire industry would be in real trouble overnight. And so I am. I'm trying in the same way that like people have become stewards of the 
of the publishing category of the, the comics category to make people understand that like this is a renewable resource that can be part of your agenda that can be a stop that can be a wonderful like experience for your cre- for the creators and can and 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 for comics creators that like you can use the same strategies that you're using comics to absolutely decimate in novels because yeah. there's nobody doing it. There's nobody using imagery in the way that comics does. There's nobody writing pages like comics does. There's nobody who makes a wise statement like comics does. Like there's no way, there's nowhere that like you could be more effective yeah. with the, with a platform you already know than to expand. And additionally, on top of that, like I always say, I, I try and stay away from the same, from doing a comic again for six months between projects. But like, I still make novels. I still do pins. I still like make other pieces. And it can be a thing where you're like, wow, I don't want to do like the same book again. Like, I don't want to do another comic two months after my last campaign. Or crap, my new my new campaign is not going to fulfill for six months. Well, like you could still drop a novel campaign because it's a different category of project and still have success and still make people say, oh, okay, he's not going to make another comic, but this is a different thing that I know will be fulfilled much quicker and can keep my appetite going for either the same universe or a different, or or, or, or a completely different universe and a completely different style or completely different, uh, a completely different genre that maybe you haven't done before. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to ask you, because um, with some of your most recent um, fiction releases, um, and this is something that I think creators have to make the decision when they launch their Kickstarters, like what's the scope of my launch, uh, the the graphic novel versus the single issue. In pro space, for you, uh, it seems like you've been launching sort of uh, your, your slate of novels for a season. And so you've actually been launching multiple novels within one launch versus uh, just, hey, all this focus under one launch. Um, how, how have you found that to work and why has that been your approach? I think part of it is because you are a extremely fast writer at this point. And, uh, and so you're able to produce more novels. You're probably able to write novels faster than you are able to launch Kickstarters at this point, even though you're damn good at Kickstarters. But uh, I'm just curious what, what's your thoughts about that and, and that being an option for some writers who might be like, oh, I don't want to launch Kickstarters like, for every project I do, but this is, seems to be another way to go. Sure. So I think of the way I launch novels very much the same. The, the the reason I only launch graphic novel Kickstarters with one exception, which is my biggest concern is velocity to market. I don't want to wait six months to do campaigns. I want to have a, a, a lot, a, a, a hefty offer when I go to people. Not so, and I, I shoot myself in the foot, Tyler. We've talked about this before. We're like, I would make just so much more money if I did single issues before a graphic novel, right? But like, I I want to have the books available into the open market faster. And so I give up, God, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars probably by like not doing the single issue campaigns because I care about that most. I care about velocity of market most of all. And in the same way, I want, I want to have novels to have velocity to market as well, which is like, I write a book, I can write a 80, 90,000 word book fully done in four to five weeks and a 60,000 word book in like three weeks, three and a half weeks. Usually by the end of three weeks, I'll have like a 60,000 word book done. So yeah, over 12 weeks, I can write four books and that allows me to be able to, to launch into the open market with just a lot more product than most people have without having to, burn out my audience doing issue one, then issue two, issue three, issue four. I know a lot of people do it very successfully. I, 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 I and I, I will probably change the way that I'm doing stuff once I have, you know, once I finish sort of this slate of books that I'm doing, just again, to have that velocity that I can, that I can hit people and say, I'm launching four books because on the, in an Amazon comiXology, like people want the more issues that you can give them the better. And like that helps you sell for the long term. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that my audience told me 
very specifically, they did not want me to launch a book every month, like, or every three weeks when I was done with the book. Like, and I know this because like, <laughs> I launched a bunch of books in that manner. And then when I asked them why they didn't buy, like, I didn't, I didn't just take their word for it. Like I'd launched a bunch of books and I was like, why you all bought this book? Like the books that I want to put them on a Kickstarter. Why didn't you buy them when I was launching them here? And they were all like, I just didn't want to have, I didn't want to have like, you kept bombarding me with an email every two weeks. And you know, I send a lot of emails, but mm. like people are willing to accept it seemingly when you can do less. Like, so I decided I would do, I would only do one launch for a campaign for, for a, for a product a year, if I could help it. And so I did, I did a launch at the end for it, for, for, for volume two of Ichabod at the end of last year. And then in March of this year. So technically I didn't break my rule, but like, I like to have a year between projects generally to let people like read them, consume them, simmer on them and like enjoy them. So, um, so, so yeah, those, for those reasons are why I, I choose to do it that way. But there is very little doubt that I would probably make like, I mean, look at what we did with this campaign. I know it's like over $6,000 for one book, whereas like I do $10,000 for, for, uh, for like four books. There's no doubt that like I would make way more money on a per book basis, but that, that is always a thing as publishers we have to think about is what is our velocity to market? Like what is our go to market strategy? How quickly can I get to market versus versus how how much money do I need? And balancing that, I think, is one of the biggest struggles of publishing because uh, you you can you can you can deal with literally getting every dollar that exists out there. Yeah. Um, or you can worry about getting the final product. And there's probably somewhere in the middle that like is the sweet spot and you have to find the sweet spot between those two places for you. And I've found that uh, doing one, one, uh, as many series as I have doing one Kickstarter for them a year and, uh, and, 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 and then bundling four issues into a trade or four books into, like, it just made sense to me because I bundle four to six issues into a trade. So I would have not bundle four to six issues, four to six books into like a bundle myself. Like just, again, a lot of things that happen in the publishing category in the publishing category, when looked at through a lens of comics, like, oh, of course, like I wanted them to have a complete story for the Obsidian Spindle Sog. And that meant four books, which each equate to roughly one issue of comic that tell a complete story, which is exactly how my Ichabod works, which is four, four, four issues tell a complete arc of, a, of, of that book. Awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I see where you're coming at. And, and I've sort of had this conversation with a lot of creators. Like they want the answer to be, well, I can just launch the graphic novel. And it's like, yes, you can. You absolutely can. You make the rules. Um, I don't know of any reason why why you, you should expect that one launch will raise more funding than multiple launches that build upon, upon one another. Um, but there are other factors at play, especially when you're someone like yourself, you have multiple series and multiple uh, passions and you're, you know, and you're putting out stuff in different genres and things like that. There is a, uh, you know, a time cost to and, a, and an emotional wear and tear cost to the volume and the, the number of launches that you put out. So, you know, everyone can share your perspectives. And, and in some cases, you know, Yes, leaving profit on the table is not necessarily the worst thing that you can do when you're factoring other things. And so, you know, this sort of brings up a, a slightly uh, different topic, but one that over the course of your sort of public career, you've been very outspoken about mental health issues and your own mental health uh, journey and struggles. And and um, it's OK if you don't want to get into it, but, you know, conventions are kicking back into gear. Uh, I've had some creators that sort of want to talk about or, or wondering my perspective on, hey, is it okay to start doing conventions again? Um, and I know that you had an experience with your first convention that uh, had some highs and lows to it. And so I'm, I'm just curious, you know, what are your what's your thought to jumping back into the convention game here at uh, in, in the still pandemic-y 2021 uh, 
So I have yeah. found, well, it, this depends like on your risk tolerance level, right? Like I generally am a, am a, uh, a, I don't have great mental health. <laughs> uh, uh, it's just, I, you know, I'm on medication. Like sometimes the medication is really off. I had panic attacks on the floor of the convention that I did, like, because I saw people that weren't wearing masks. Uh, like I, I generally, and my wife also like has her own issues. Like most of the people that I know are like chronically ill. So like, it's just, it's, I I've learned, I've learned to stop seeming so bulletproof and how like one bad decision can like, or one, or one thing can like ruin the rest of your life. So I am much more cautious now than I was at the beginning of my career. And also I have the ability to say, like, I don't want to do shows. Like I make I, I'm a full-time comic creator or a full-time writer. Uh, and I can make the decision, even if it's a hit in the wallet to not do conventions. And like, that is a privileged position. And, and I include people that do like have a full-time job in that. Like you, you know, if you don't need the money to go to comic conventions, you have a much different opinion on this. I know artists who haven't done conventions in, in 18 months and that's the only way they make money and they're literally doing 14 conventions in a row like i mean 14 weeks in a row 14 conventions and that sounds horrifying to me but like that's how they make their money there are also people who enjoy conventions more than i do i think people generally think of conventions in the rosy glow part of it and not the absolute yeah uh, mind screw of rejection and <laughs> like people looking through you and just like messing with your table and like destroying things on your table and just callousness. Now this is not everyone. Like you go through that. So you find the people who are like lovely and wonderful. And I'm not saying buy your book, but at least like have a decent conversation. I also tend to think that like the work that I do is not like, I feel such like a salesman when like I'm making this thing that is in like my heart thing. Like, it's not like I looked out and was like, Hey, uh, uh, there's like someone was making plush penises at the last camp convention. And like, I don't know, maybe it is like their heart's maybe desire to make that. But like, <laughs> there's so many people on the floor that are like, Hey, Popeye's popular. Like I'm going to make a Popeye. Like, I don't care if it sells, like it's a Popeye, like whatever, or what, yeah. you know, that thing. You know, someone like the people that pour the root beer at the shows, at least over in my neck of the woods, it's like, okay, like how much do they love root beer so much that like, that's the thing. Like if someone doesn't buy it, they're going to get bummed. No, they're bummed if they don't make the money. But like, I doubt they are bummed if like someone's like turns down root beer aside from more just the monetary hustle of having the root beer. Um, I would love to be wrong about that, but, and the, all of uh, and uh, so I tend to take it pretty personally. People think that I'm this like steel trap of humanity, but like I take it very personally. And that's why I have so many things in place where like I have spent the last two years talking to people who love my work and who I love personally and who I, whose work I love and to be back out in a world where most people don't know who I am and I have to do the dance just to like get people to talk to me and most mm. people talk to me not nicely uh maybe not most people but like the people that just walk past tend to be pretty rude about it yeah um to their own benefit like they don't like comics or like they're they have to do an autograph line or like whatever the thing is whatever they're, they're having a bad day like whatever the reason but like it was very jarring to me to suddenly be in a place where like oh I have to do the dance again because mm. like people don't know who I am and like, not that I'm a big name creator or anything, but like, I just, I lived in a, I had a bubble where I work at home. I have meetings like this. Yeah. I, 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 I talk to creators who like, we love each other's work. Like I'm on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And like, it's, it's pretty good time. Um, uh, and, and to go back into the world of conventions, especially in a world of conventions where the people were not good about mask mandates, um, and I'm really surprised it wasn't a super spreader event. It was, and to see people like on the floor of the convention eating out of a com communal bowl of salsa that they were doing salsa tastings out of like <laughs> these things, like, like affected me in a way that 
maybe if I was more professional, like I would not be so, or if I could distance myself from the work, yeah. I would be less like affected by, again, not the people who don't buy. Like, I don't mind if you come and have a t conversation at my table and you don't buy, I mind. Like what, my, what I mind more is like just the callous indifference. Um, but I put myself out there for it. And it was a thing that I used to be able to do. And I could used to be able to survive because there was no other way. And I still very much believe that like, there is no other way to come to, to have a full, full, fully comics career without doing conventions, unless like you get anointed by Marvel or DC, or you happen to have a massive hit. Like, and even then I am not convinced that like, you can do this job without having conventions as a, a part of it. And uh, even for me, even for like a huge name, like, cause I watch them on the circuit and like, they're still there. Like they're still there. Jamie Tyndall should not have to do the convention scene, but like there he is at every show doing the convention scene. And like, I don't know. It's, it's so I, decided that the, the the way that I will do shows moving forward matters. What matters the most is the convention organizer. I thought this before, but like, I need the convention organizer to take this seriously because it doesn't matter if the showrunner takes it seriously. If the organizer doesn't take it seriously, they're not, they're just going to flub. They're just going to not care about whatever the thing is in place. And maybe you don't care about that stuff. And like, I watch people all the time that like do these conventions and like, like they're doing one every weekend and like my stomach is curled, but like, Hey, that's their risk tolerance level. Um, uh, I don't have the same. Uh, if you've always been healthy, then awesome. Like I'm very, pr I'm very happy that you've always been healthy uh, and that you can like risk a uh, long COVID or whatever that I just can't risk. Um, and if you're at the, or at, the, or at the early part of your career, whew, I don't know. I don't know how you make the decision to not do them if you really want to do this job. Like Kickstarter is great, but like it is a, it is a symbiotic cycle with conventions. You meet people at conventions, they back you, you become fr friends with them. They back your book. Like they help you promote they do all of that stuff. Like, I don't know how anything besides that mechanic functions for the vast majority of creators, because like, it's not just like I can slide into some random person's DMS and like, they'll they're, like, it won't come across as weird, but right. like I can walk up to their table at a show and chat with them and have many times before and signed with a ton of people that I never would have been able to sign with. Uh, otherwise and been associated with people that I, on panels that I never would have even been been able to be associated with and like I I again I'm in a very privileged position to be able to even talk about whether it's time to do shows yet because I don't see how you can make a career in comics without conventions without making them a at least for a couple of years at the beginning of your career um because it's just it's where all editors are. It's where all publishers are at some time of year. It's where all creators are at some time of the year. It's how you meet people. It's how you meet. It's how you. It's how you bond with creators. Uh, it's how you. It's how you buy like some weird comics that like aren't really even available on. It's how you even know comics exist. Yeah, like different comics exist. So I don't. I think that if the right if like something like Rose City or New York Comic Con, like if they're serious about letting only vaccinated people come in or like people that have a badge uh, that, that have like a negative COVID test, like it's probably, it's probably as safe as a thing could be. It's probably on some levels safer than it was before when we just let the flu run rampant and got con crud and then would joke about it afterwards. Like I'd have rarely seen someone get con crud at a show like that was like, vaccinated and such yeah um so i if you are worried about that and god if you live in like a place like texas or alabama or louisiana or somewhere where like they don't take this stuff seriously and only 25 percent of the population is vaccinated like i don't again i don't i don't know how you make that calculus but for me my rule is if you're not if you if your show does not require vaccinations i'm not doing it period end of story 
if you do require vaccinations, then I need to know how your organizer, like the people who own the show feel about it, or if they're just doing it by like, because they are mandated to do it because like California has mandates, but like a show could just like, it's not like the cops are patrolling every minute of the day. Like they could just, yeah. you know, they just like, there's only so much that a convention organizer can do if they don't care. There's so that the, uh, that, that, a, that a mandate would do. So um, I think if you have those two things, if like, you know, the company is serious. Like I, I after seeing what happened at New York comic con, like I think read pop is serious about this. Like I think read pop like, like is serious about having vaccine mandates. Like they're not just doing it because they were, they were, um, they were, they, they were told to do it. Like they're doing it. Cause like they care. Um, uh, they are, but there are a lot of shows that like just are only doing it the bare minimum. Right. And then you have to factor in the, this idea that like these shows haven't done anything in two years. So like, like it's a lot of these shows are like either we have a show or like we go out of business and I take on a hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars or a ten thousand dollars of debt, whatever that debt is. And so, like, how serious are they going to be? Not just even if they are serious, because they got to get people in the door. Yeah. So I, I also wonder, you know, there's labor shortages up and down in every industry right now. And mo a lot of those conventions like could only exist based on volunteers. I'm wondering how, like, if we can't get people to work for money, um, how, like, how is the staffing of, yeah, I mean, of some I mean, of these shows? I, I'll tell you well? at that, at the show that I did, I was shocked that how little security there was like places that I would expect security that I've always seen security at every mm -hmm. show, just like not there either because they couldn't staff it or for some other reason. Um, so it's hard to answer that question. Like it's yeah. always so impossible to answer the question of like, is it safe to do shows? Because like, it was probably never safe to do shows. I mean, like I would tell people, I'm, I'm surprised every convention did not end up with like someone getting shot. Like I'm just, <laughs> I mean, there's 50,000 people. There's a hundred thousand <laughs> yeah. people. Like there's freaking like, there's like action comics. Number one, like out just like, it's a million dollar, like, Thing. It was a million dollars five years ago when I yeah. saw it at a convention, like Amazing Fantasy 15. Like these things are there, like multi million dollars are sitting there. And like it's only costs, like it's only like four ounces to pick it up. And like yet they're all pretty well behaved humans at the show. They're all considerate. Like I went to see a concert last a couple nights ago and I also was like, wow, there are 15,000 people here. And they're all just chilling. Mm. So like what? So like, I don't, I live in Los Angeles where like has a 70% vaccination rate. So like my level of, 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 of security is way higher than most people in this country. Um, but I would not go, if something has an overall population rate, sub 50% that is vaccinated, I would not go to that show. Even if they had a mask, even if they were vaccine required, like I just would not go because most of the people, because what you don't see is like, then, so when I went to the show that I was in, I was in a place with a 49% vaccination rate and um, they had every bar, every place had like no masks. Like, so like, where was I going to eat? They didn't have outdoor seating. Like they didn't have, like, I was like, oh, cool. There was a mask mandate inside the convention center, but I walk outside and like, nope, every place I sit, everywhere I look, like I'm not safe anywhere. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's an amazing just recalibration of things that you didn't take for granted and, and things that you do. And I, I think you're right. You, you can't like, th there is no, you know, this is, a, this has got to be ultimately a personal decision of, of risk tolerance and interest and, 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 um, necessity, you know, over here, I have a three-year-old at home who is, as of right now, un unable to be vaccinated. And so, and then also, you know, he is, he now goes to school and the school has certain requirements about when you travel and when you don't and leaving out, going out of town. And so, you know, for the, for the time being, I've still, you know, hitting the pause button on, on, um, conventions for myself. But again, um, having, as you said, that, that, that is a luxury of, you know, being at a point where, um, you know, conventions were already diminishing in terms of the importance to my overall publishing and business model um, to the point where in 2020, they absolutely, it absolutely flatlined and there was zero. <laughs> and, and 
you know, still managed to have a good year. Um, but, but yeah, um, I, I, I told, but I, on the, on the, on the other side, I also know that even though comics creators get a, a knock as being introverts largely, and we are largely introverts, uh, we still, that doesn't mean introverts don't love and need that communicate, that community, that communication, that interaction. And, and so I have been inspired and, and excited to see some of my, my favorite people in the world of indie comics, uh, start going to shows again and start selling books again and, and getting, getting some of that mojo back. Well, sometimes um, it's not. Sometimes there's just that's where they sell books. Like yeah. some people don't use Kickstarter. A lot of yeah. people don't. And some people use it very sparingly. And like that's where they sell books. And that's how they like to sell books. And it, it's hard. I would ask you, listener, viewer, do you really love shows? Or do you love the dopamine hit that you get five seconds after making a sale? or after the convention floor closes because you see people mm -hmm. because they're two different things. And uh, just like women forget childbirth because it's just too painful. We as comic creators often think we really love a thing that we do not actually love, or we only love a very small piece of. Well, it's that's, I think it's that same phenomenon that um, affects why people only remember, only tend to remember the beginning and end of movies and they only tend to, 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 and on Kickstarter, they tend to come out of out of a successful Kickstarter really positive, even though I can go back and look at the, you know, look at the tape of all of the frantic posts that people make during the Kickstarter launch when things slow down in the dead zone. But but you, you snip the ends. You remember the excitement of setting up and getting everything up, and then you remember the joy of being it over and having a fat stack of. Uh, cash in your in your wallet what you don't remember is how your legs turned to jelly from standing on concrete for th four days in a row and yeah and, and just uh, the being tired and eating yeah. poorly like i have never eaten better in my life than like the last couple of years when like i didn't have to do shows and the minute i went to a show I was like oh yeah there's no <laughs> option to eat good yeah. here like i just have to either leave the convention so what i did the last day when i had a panic attack and i left the floor was I was I would text people and I was like, are you going to be out of the floor? I'd love to get lunch with you. I'd love to meet with you, but it has to be like out of the convention floor. And maybe that is a thing. That's a thing a lot of my friends did at Comic-Con and like I always thought was weird, but like now I totally get like not wanting to be at the, wanting to see the people, but not wanting to go to the show. Or like maybe yeah. you only go to the show for two hours a day or something like that. But like there are all of these ways to do conventions that do not involve being inside the germ filled convention hall. And if you love that, like I know people, I think they're crazy that love it, that uh, 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 this person, the uh, Ma mask, Ma mass effect, Com mass effect comics is saying um, like they love conventions. Like the one above that is like, I love conventions. I, lo I love doing them. And like, that's great. Like I would just ask, it, it, do you really love them? And if you do like, and you can find the things that are that, 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 that you love, then awesome. Like do the, do them, go do them, yeah. please go do them and not have it. But um, if you, it, it will be a shock to your system to be in front of so many people. You've never been in front of that many people like for the last two years, like, ne like even at a, even at a, like, sporting event or something if you went to like, like it's not the same like a sport a coliseum is enormous there's no bottlenecks like it is going to mess with your head hmm. if you do not already know that you love crowds and all of that stuff i thought that i was going to be fine at this convention i did not realize it's going to have panic attacks so i would say like if you're on the fence you should probably wait or if you maybe love a part of conventions but don't love all of them. There's all sorts of ways to like have the experience of conventions without like going to one. Yeah. Um, and if you're in an area where the, where the, where the people or the organizers don't, don't like, don't seem to care, like, and you care, cause you might be listening to this and not care. Like you may be like unvaccinated and like not wearing masks and everything being like, this guy's crazy. But like, if you care, like you got to play the calculus. And one of the hardest parts about this, which we don't ever talk about with conventions is like, what if you get COVID on the floor and you can't fly home? 
because that is a thing that will happen. Like they're not going to let you on a plane if you have a positive COVID test. So like, how do you deal with these outlying things that used to not matter? Yeah. That now very much matter. Like no one has ever said, oh, I, uh, I got the flu and I couldn't fly. Like I got, they just fly, just fly. <laughs> like, but with COVID, like you, you don't, you can't like get on a plane, even if you're sick, like you just can't do it. So there yeah. are all these outlier things that is what makes 2020 so hard for me, 2022 so hard to predict, which is like, yeah, I'm probably not going to get COVID at a show, but like I had a show, uh, I had a, sh- I, I, I was, I was supposed to do a show right before I went home for the holidays. And I was like, okay, well, like I do a show when I go to the holidays, I go home for Christmas. I get symptoms a couple of days later, I get a COVID test on like the Friday. Suddenly I'm like COVID positive. And like, I can't fly to Raleigh to see my, my, my wife's family. I can't fly home. Like I'm just stuck in wherever I was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's just, there's too many factors. If if you can't, if you cannot do it, I would say don't do it. But if you're asking where, where it's safe, like those are the factors that I would consider if it's safe. Yeah. Yeah. Books can help you do more Kickstarters. So you don't have to do shows. (laughs) Exactly. I I feel like the convention topic could have been its own show right there. Um, but the book is available now on Kickstarter uh, for authors and it's comprehensive. I mean, you're covering uh, soup to nuts, what you need to know from uh, the beginning planning stages all the way to uh, the end and, and even the next steps. Um, and I, I think um, Monica's suite of books uh, will also be worth taking a look at to um, see what what you can do even beyond Kickstarter. So what's I'm great is. Yeah to, see, this, yeah, to see all of the stuff that you can also do and all of the ways, you know, we have an events book, we've got a book that's selling in print, but I want to bring up, if I may, like one of the reward tiers, which I've never offered before. And yeah. I never intend to offer again, which is for a hundred dollars, uh, you get the book obviously, but you get to sprint with me and Monica as I unlock literally every step that I do along the process. And then we all launch a book together, like different books, but like we all launch a book in January. I've never done it before. Uh, I I'm very confident with how it will work. Cause I'm going to go through and like tinker with campaigns and like, look at all of the things and you're going to have access to me that I've never had before. So like if, if you're in comics, like I welcome you to like do a comics campaign. Uh, if you're a book person, like I welcome you to do a book campaign, but like, there are things in this thing that I'm never doing again. Like for $150, you get the course. Like the course will be available. But like for $500, you get the course, three hours of my time and other stuff that like, I'm just not, I'm not a consulting guy. Like I do yeah. some consulting, but like I don't do it. But easily the best singular reward if you are, if you want to do Kickstarters better, whether it's comics or novels uh, or children's books or anything to do with books is that $100 pledge level. And like we've already got about 20 people into it, but everything from a hundred dollars and up gets into that sprint group. And like, I highly recommend if you can do it to do that one, because you're going to get literally unprecedented access to me. Yeah. And I, and I see that there's also a gift version of that as well. So even if this isn't something that uh, you're going to use, um, if you happen to be someone that stumbles across this and knows there's an author in your life that, uh, needs a kick in the pants to, uh, to get their project out there. That sounds like a, a really awesome opportunity. Yeah. I, I mean, any kind of book product I'm going to be able to help people with, and I'm doing this specifically because I've never had something that was under a hundred dollars to offer people when they ask me about Kickstarter. So mm. like, I think that it's really important. One of the best things about this is not only are you getting my Kickstarter expertise, but you're getting Monica's publishing expertise and she's launched way more books than me and is way more successful on me when it comes to tr- training authors, how to sell books on Amazon and everywhere else. So she is literally going to take all of these things and incorporate all of the Kickstarter stuff into a way that like works for publishing and the publishing side of Kickstarter. And if you're a comic person, you are publishing, like you're publishing and she's going to be able to, she's going to help show you, how like comics fits in and how just your book fits into the overall 
Kickstarter or the overall book ecosystem. And one thing that uh, there is a there's a there's a I think for two hundred and fifty dollars you get a complete uh, the uh, the whole author library of Monica's stuff. And like what I hear over and over again is, man, I wish you could get my books my comics selling after Kickstarter <laughs> or like hmm. on Amazon or on wide platforms or on any of those things. And like literally the entire wide library, this thing that Monica is doing and what she's consulting on and all of this stuff is for getting your book selling on all of the platforms. And if you're a comics book person, that includes all of the platforms you need to be selling on, especially and especially because Comixology is no longer accepting new submissions. And the only way to publish books on Amazon is to publish them through KDP. If you mm. have a comic that is, this, uh, and they just sent an email yesterday to confirm that like starting in September 15th, they are no longer accepting submissions to Comixology. If you want to publish on Amazon, you, the only option you have is KDP and Amazon and, and, and um, Monica's uh, book and the, uh, getting the author library is a way to like get your, the, she will explain to you how to get your book selling on all of these platforms, many of which you've probably never heard of before. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a wide world out there and uh, you just sc scratch the surface if you've only touched in on Kickstarter and conventions. So um, I'm so glad that you have uh, partnered up with Monica to, to add this book to it and uh, make the world uh, and the comics launch listeners aware of, of what else is out there, Russell. So uh, I appreciate you appreciate your time and uh, congrats again on this latest launch. Thanks a lot. Kickstarternovel.com will get you right there. All right. Take care, my friend.